we all need water, right? I mean, we kind of take it for granted, but we literally can't live without it. But when was the last time you actually thought about water? Like really thought about it? Yeah, it's deceivingly simple, isn't it? Just two little hydrogen atoms and an oxygen. But trust me, it gets way more interesting. Right. It's like like that quiet person you knew in school and then boom, you find out they have all these hidden talents and a whole secret life nobody knew about. Exactly. And we are going deep into that secret life today with Mei Wan Ho and her book, Living Rainbow H2O. We're going deep on the weird and wonderful world of H2O in this deep dive. Everything from why water behaves so strangely to its role in the mysteries of life itself. Get ready because this is going to change how you look at that glass of water in your nightstand. So first up, let's talk about how water just seems to break all the rules of chemistry. Did you know that based on its molecular weight, water should actually be a gas at room temperature? It's true. Look at the periodic table. Mm -hmm. Everything in water's neighborhood is a gas at room temperature, but not water. It's like it just decided to be different. Talk about inconvenient. Imagine opening the fridge and instead of a nice cold bottle of water, it's just a puff of vapor. Right, and there's ice. Think about it for a second. Most things, when they freeze, they get denser, right? The solid sinks to the bottom, not water. Thank goodness for that. Can you imagine if lakes and oceans froze from the bottom up? You'd be a disaster for life. <laughs> But water, it forms this special ice that floats on top and that protects everything underneath. It's almost like water was designed for life or something. You could say that? Yeah. And it all comes down to how those tiny water molecules interact with each other. Ever heard of hydrogen bonds? Oh, yeah. Vaguely. Back in high school chemistry class, I think. Well, those hydrogen bonds are the key to understanding water. It's yeah. like this constant dance, this attraction between the hydrogen of one water molecule and the oxygen of another. So it's like they're all holding hands and switching partners constantly. Yeah, exactly. And these bonds, they're not static. They're constantly forming and breaking, creating this amazing dynamic network. They're not just bouncing around randomly. There's a message to this madness. And this dance is what gives water these strange properties. Like this is why Eichel floats. You got it. When water freezes, those hydrogen bonds, they kind of force the molecules into this very open crystalline structure. Mm. And that structure it actually has more space between the molecules than in liquid water. So ice is kind of like water, but with more breathing room. Exactly. And because it has more space, it's less dense. And that, my friend, is why ice floats. Okay, that's pretty cool. But you're telling me this is just the beginning, right? There's more to these little molecules. Well, so much more. We used to think water molecules were just randomly arranged, but now with these new cutting-edge techniques. By techniques, you mean things that would take me years to understand. Well, let's just say scientists have some really fancy tools at their disposal these days. One of them is called 2D IRPE spectroscopy. It's like using lasers to watch these water molecules interact in real time. Wow, a super slow motion camera for molecules. <laughs> so what are they seeing with this technology? What's the big reveal? It turns out that water molecules aren't just randomly jumbled together. They're actually forming these fleeting, intricate clusters that constantly morph and exchange energy with each other. Wait, so like little gangs of water molecules hanging out, switching members, passing around secret messages. What kind of messages are we talking about here? Okay, it's not exactly a high school cafeteria, but you're getting the idea. Mm. These clusters and how fast they're swapping energy might be the key to how water interacts with other molecules, especially in living things. Wow. Okay, so it's not just about the molecules themselves. It's how they're connected and interacting and exchanging energy. It's like a whole society of water molecules in every drop. Exactly. And every society needs a bit of structure, right? You're going to tell me these clusters have structure? They're not just random. Well, Mate my one ho talks about this scientist, Martin Chaplin, who came up with a really interesting model. He thinks that a group of 280 water molecules can come together in this really specific, beautiful shape. He calls it an icosahedron. An icosa what now? An icosahedron. Mm -hmm. It's got 20 faces, kind of like a 20-sided die, but obviously way, way smaller. Okay, so like a microscopic 20-sided die made of water molecules. Got it. And what makes this shape so special? Well, first of all, it's just really elegant, you yeah. know, but... It also fits the experimental data, like it, it explains how water's density changes at different temperatures, and it even gives us a framework for understanding those coherent domains we talked about. The synchronized water molecule gangs. Those are the ones. Chaplin's model suggests that within this icosahedron, certain water molecules are more likely to line up and vibrate together, which is how you get those coherent domains. 
So we're going from simple molecules to these intricate clusters to this beautifully ordered icosahedron. It's like water has a whole universe going on inside every drop. And it gets even more interesting because this icosahedral shape, it's not random. It's actually connected to something called the golden ratio. Wait, the golden ratio, like in art and architecture, what does that have to do with water? It seems to pop up everywhere in nature, doesn't it? Mm. From sunflowers to seashells to the human body. Mm. And now, potentially, even in the way water molecules arrange themselves. You're blowing my mind here. So you're saying there's this hidden code in water, this mathematical beauty. It's a possibility that's got scientists and mathematicians pretty excited. And it gets even weirder when we start talking about water memory. Okay, now we're getting into some seriously out there territory. Isn't that where, like, homeopathy comes in? Homeopathy often gets lumped in with water memory, but there's a lot of debate about that. We should probably do a whole other deep dive just on that topic. But Mewanho does mention a researcher named Luc Montagnier. He's a virologist who actually won a Nobel Prize for his work on HIV. No way. The HIV guy is researching water memory. Yeah, it seems kind of left field, right? But his research has suggested that DNA sequences, even when they're no longer physically present, might still be able to leave some kind of electromagnetic signature on water. So like an echo, but of information instead of sound. That's a good way to think about it. Now, this is definitely an area where more research is needed, but it's a pretty wild concept, isn't it? It really makes you wonder what else water is capable of. We've gone from this passive substance to something that's dynamic, structured, and maybe even able to hold memories. And believe it or not, it gets even stranger. My Wan Ho also talks about this idea of burning water. Hold on, burning water? I'm pretty sure water puts out fire, not starts it. You're telling me. But there's actually this phenomenon, discovered completely by accident, that suggests it might be possible. Okay, I'm listening. How on earth do you burn water? So it all started with an inventor named John Cancius. He was doing some experiments with radio waves and salt water. He was trying to find a way to use them to destroy cancer cells. Sounds like a good goal. Definitely. But one day, during one of his experiments, he noticed something really unexpected. The salt water he was zapping with these radio waves, it suddenly burst into flames. The water, or more specifically, the hydrogen in the water, was burning. Whoa, that sounds like something out of a movie. How is that even possible? Well, to understand that, we need to talk about quantum electrodynamics. Quantum electro... Say what now? You lost me. Yeah, it's a mouthful, isn't it? Basically, it's the study of how light and matter interact at a really, really tiny level, like subatomic particles. Okay, and how does that explain burning water? Remember those coherent domains? Yeah. Those groups of water molecules all vibrating together? Yeah, how could I forget at this point? Well, some scientists believe that those coherent domains, they might be able to absorb energy from external sources, like radio waves in this case. Oh, the radio waves are basically energizing the water. In a way, yes. And if enough energy is absorbed, it can actually split those water molecules apart, releasing hydrogen gas. And as you know... Hydrogen gas is highly flammable, so it wasn't the water itself burning, but the hydrogen that was being released from the water. Exactly. And as long as the radio waves were focused on the water, that flame... It could be sustained. So let me get this straight. Water, this thing we drink every day, it's breaking the laws of chemistry and might be storing secrets, and now you're telling me we can make it burn. It's like we're talking about a completely different substance. It really makes you think, doesn't it? Yeah. And the craziest part is, we're just scratching the surface of what water can do. Yeah. There's still so much we don't know. It's kind of mind-boggling. Every time we get an answer, it just leads to more questions. That's what's so exciting about it. It keeps us guessing. But maybe we should try to sum up what we have learned today. Yeah, a little recap would be good. We've covered a lot of ground. Let's see, we started with water being kind of a rebel, right? It mm. just refuses to follow the rule. Exactly. It should be a gas at room temperature, but it's not. Ice should sink, but it floats. And those quirks, as strange as they seem, they're actually what make water so perfect for life. Exactly. And then we went even deeper down to the level of those hydrogen bonds and those constantly moving, always changing clusters of water molecules. Clusters that, surprise, might be way more organized than we thought, maybe even forming those beautiful icosahedral shapes because of that golden ratio magic. Right. And, of course, we couldn't forget about water memory. Even though it sounds like something out of a sci-fi movie, the idea that water might hold information, maybe even some kind of electromagnetic memory, it's a pretty wild thought to consider. It really is. And then, just when we thought it couldn't get any stranger, we talk about burning water. Burning water, thanks to the power of quantum electrodynamics. 
I never thought I'd say those words in the same sentence. But where does all of this leave us? It's almost too much to process. Bawan Hulu's book does a great job of exploring what these discoveries might mean, not just for things like biology and medicine, but even for energy and consciousness itself. It's incredible when you think about it. Water really isn't just a background character in the story of life. It's an active participant shaping and influencing everything around it. So next time you're enjoying a cool glass of water, just remember you're not just quenching your thirst. You're interacting with one of the most mysterious substances in the universe. That's right. Water is way more fascinating than we give it credit for. Thanks for diving deep with us on this episode. Until next time, stay curious.